That took 32 seconds. Can you believe that? That would have taken me 15 minutes to go into AWS and click around and get all of that stuff built out. The VPC, the subnet, the route tables, the internet gateway, security group, the EC2 instance, that would have taken me 15 minutes. And this is completely repeatable. What's up everybody? It's Travis here from Travis.media. So I've been on this DevOps kick now for a couple of weeks. I figured I'd just keep the momentum going. And today we're gonna talk about one of the more important tools in DevOps called Terraform. And before we actually get into it, let me tell you why you need to know it in 2023 or 2024, whatever year it is. I think that's the title of my video. So let me address that first. So if you're looking to get into DevOps or site reliability engineering or cloud computing, it's a requirement. It's literally on every single job posting out there. You might see CloudFormation, you might see Pulumi or something like that, but you're always gonna see Terraform. So if you're in those camps, you're looking to get into those fields, then you must learn Terraform. And if you're a developer, you may not think this really applies to you. I mean, Terraform is for the DevOps, Ops guys. I'm a developer, I don't need that. But to get ahead in this industry, you need to have a basic understanding of a lot. You need to know the gist of many things. And the more well-rounded you are in this way, the more you'll get ahead in the industry. So being aware of Terraform, how it's used, being able to use it in your discussions, maybe offer to utilize it or suggest it in your day-to-day -day work, I think is very, very important. Second, we all have side projects. All devs have some kind of side project they're working on. And whenever they start that side project, they have to spin up resources and get things set up. Why not use Terraform to configure all of that for you so that it's push button to get that set up? And then when you're done, push button to tear it back down. And last, infrastructure's code isn't going anywhere. In fact, it's basically the standard now. Nobody does the click ops stuff anymore. It's all code. The sooner you understand it, the better. And that's why I think you need to learn that this year, even if on a surface level. So in this video, I'm gonna talk about it, tell you what it is, some of its benefits, and then we're gonna do a practical dive into it. So whatever field you're in, if you're a developer, if you're a DevOps, if you're looking to get into any of that stuff, by the end of this video, you'll understand what it is and you'll be able to use it because I'm gonna show you how. So first things first, what is infrastructure as code? Infrastructure as code is basically writing your infrastructure, which is your servers, your databases, your networks, all of that stuff, writing that to version controlled scripts or code. It's your entire environment and infrastructure represented in a configuration code base. You can use one command, build the whole thing, every detail of it, and use another command to tear it all down. And since it's version controlled, teams of engineers can make changes to the code and update the infrastructure in one single source of truth. So in short, infrastructure's code is just what it says it is. It's your infrastructure represented and maintained by code. Second, what is Terraform then? Well, Terraform is an open source infrastructure's code tool created by HashiCorp. You can define cloud and on-premises environments in config files that are easy to read, they're version controlled, they can be automated and shared with one another. With Terraform, you can easily work with major cloud environments, AWS, Azure, and other tools like Kubernetes, Docker, Helm, etc. And you work with these services through third-party tools called providers. So there's a whole registry of these Terraform providers. There's the AWS provider, the Azure provider, Kubernetes provider, the Docker provider, a provider for each one of these services that allows you to interact with these services. And one of the best things about Terraform is it's agentless. You don't have to go installing agents on all your servers or databases or whatever. You just use these providers. These providers allow you to talk via an API to these services. So Terraform is an infrastructure as code tool. You essentially declare what your environment should look like and Terraform will easily spin it up, update it, or tear it down for you. Now, before we get hands-on with this, let me give you some benefits of Terraform itself. Number one, it's multi-cloud. By using Terraform, you don't get locked into a cloud provider. If you're using CloudFormation and you set up all these templates to define your AWS infrastructure, you're locked into AWS. CloudFormation is AWS only. You can't take that config file and then go to Azure and do anything with it. You have to go to Azure and use their tool and figure out how to deploy it all there. With Terraform, you're not locked in like that. You can build out AWS infrastructure, Azure infrastructure, GCP infrastructure, all in one place. You can deploy on all three with one configuration file. So it's multi-cloud. Two, it's stateful. It allows you to track your resource changes throughout your deployment in a state file, which is the single source of truth for your environment. 
Terraform uses this state file to determine the changes that you're making to manage your infrastructure to make sure that it matches with your configuration. So you make some changes to your configuration, it looks at the state file, sees the changes, and updates accordingly. So it's stateful. Number three, it's version controlled. All of your developers, engineers on a team can all work on this one code base. Nobody goes into AWS and starts clicking and building new servers in secret without anybody knowing, guessing at different parameters. It's all in one place, it's in public, and it's version controlled. People can pull down the latest changes and add to it, push it up, everybody else pulls down those changes, etc. Next, it's declarative. You declare the end state of what you want your infrastructure to be, and Terraform gets you there. You don't need to write out a bunch of steps, like this happens first, then do this, then do this. You just declare what your entire infrastructure should look like, and hand it over to Terraform, and it will create that for you. And then, like I said earlier, your team can just make changes to that configuration, like we wanna change this tag, apply, and it'll go and change the tag. So that's number four, it's declarative. Number five, you don't have this manual click ops, like your manager says, hey, we need three more servers, uh, Travis, add three more servers, I gotta go in and click launch instance, and then I gotta de decide a name, and then the instance type, and all this stuff. You don't have that, that wastes time. That, as I said earlier, is a secretive approach. Nobody really knows what you're doing and nobody knows how to recreate that. Number six, you can save money with Terraform. I was on a project a couple of years ago where we had this development environment that everybody was working on and it got pretty elaborate. Everybody was putting their stuff in there and it just got expensive. And so we decided, hey, let's use Terraform to declare this environment that we have and everybody leaves the office at like set by seven in the evening and nobody really starts until seven in the morning. How about from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. we just destroy the whole thing and then at 7 a.m. we build it back for everybody to work on and if anybody needs to add anything just add it to the configuration and at seven o'clock we tear it down so 12 hours a day we didn't pay for the infrastructure. Number seven, it's great for disaster recovery. If you can spin up your entire environment in five minutes, it may not justify you having this instantly ready to go dis disaster recovery environment burning through money every day that you're not using. It may not make sense to keep it running all the time. And number eight, with Terraform, you can minimize user error. As humans, we make mistakes, we click the wrong things, we add the wrong VPCs and things like that. With Terraform, we can declare it and test it and deploy it and get it perfect. So those are eight quick benefits to Terraform. I hope you see the importance of it now. So with all of that out the way, let's see how this works. So like always, go make you a cup of coffee. I have my tea and we're going to learn how to use Terraform. So the first thing we need to do is install Terraform. If you just go to google.com and type in install Terraform, it'll bring you to this page. And you have a couple of options. You got your manual installation. Um, I'm on Mac, so I just did a homebrew. So run brew tap to install the HashiCorp tap, and then install Terraform with this brew install command. Then of course, brew update and brew upgrade to make sure you have the latest version of HashiCorp. Once you have that, you can type in something like Terraform help to make sure that it works. And if you get this, you've installed Terraform. Next, jump into your code editor. I'm using VS Code and create a new directory to do your work in. I have a directory called terraform-vid for Terraform video, and we're ready to begin. So the first thing I'm gonna do is just create a new file called main.tf, that's Terraform. A TF file is a Terraform file. And the first thing we wanna do in this file is declare a provider. Remember earlier we talked about providers? They are third-party tools we use to talk to different services like today we're going to use the AWS provider that provider allows us to talk to AWS and interact with AWS so my block would look something like this and basically it just says provider is AWS and it has a couple of parameters so profile is default I'll tell you about that in a minute and the region I'm using is US East 1 so we declare the provider and to actually authenticate with AWS you need to have the AWS CLI if you haven't downloaded that just go to uh, AWS, just type in AWS CLI. And right here, just install or updating. And this tells you how to install the AWS CLI. If I was on Mac OS, I would just download this package file. And once that's downloaded, you need to get a key in secret from AWS. So if I go to AWS and click on this drop down up here and go to security credentials, I can generate a new pair. And once that comes up, just scroll down to the section that says access keys and click on create access key and click on command line interface. 
and then click this box to confirm what you're doing and then click next. And you can set a description tag. I'm not, I'm gonna create this access key. So here's my key. What I wanna do with my CLI is I want to, let me make this a little bigger. I wanna to run, to configure it, I wanna run AWS configure and it's gonna ask me for my access key. So I'm gonna copy this access key, paste it here. And then I'm gonna copy the secret key. And don't worry, I'm gonna delete this before this video airs. If I don't, feel free to hack me. And so I'm gonna paste my secret key. Default region name, I'm gonna keep it US East 1. Just, if you don't have anything there, just put in your region. So US East 1. And then output format, I like JSON. So I'm gonna choose JSON. And now if I go to cd.aws and then do a cat on credentials, I can see I have a default profile with an access key and a secret access key. This authenticates my CLI with AWS and Terraform can use that also to authenticate. So when you go back to the code and it says profile default, that uses my default profile. If I had something else here like Travis, it wouldn't work. And then here's my region, US East 1. So that's my provider block. Now, whenever you create a new config or you pull down a already existing config that you're trying to use, you need to run a command called terraform init and make sure you save the file first. And what this is gonna do, it's gonna download your provider. So right here, finding latest version of HashiCorp slash AWS and installing that provider. So let's give that a minute to install that. Once that's installed, we can communicate with AWS. But remember, anytime you have a new configuration or you're using one that you pull down from somewhere, run terraform init first. All right, and now if you have that option enabled, you'll see these hidden folders. Here's a Terraform folder with a, another folder of providers. If you go all the way through it, you see the AWS provider has been downloaded. And there's also a lock file. Next, we have what we call the resources block. So this declares an EC2 instance. So the resource is AWS instance, and the name of it could be anything. I've called it app server. It has an AMI. I've put in this AMI ID, which is the Amazon Linux 2 server AMI. Instance type is a T2 micro, and I put a tag on it called my Terraform instance. Now, where do we get this AWS instance at? Well, if we go to the Terraform docs, so Terra, let's just do uh, Terraform AWS. Click on this, and we should be able to see all of the options for an EC2 instance. So these are all the resources in an AWS provider. If we scroll down and find EC2, and then we see all the resources. We have an AMI, we have an EC2 host, EC2 tag, all of these things. But if we keep going down to AWS instance, this is what we want. It provides an EC2 instance resource. This allows instances to be created, updated, and deleted. So that's what we're using. If we go back to the code, we are creating an AWS instance. That's in the first quotes here. And the second quotes is the name of it, how we can reference it in our code. And I've just called that app server. It could be chicken wing, but app server is a little more appropriate. So we've declared an EC2 instance. We've declared the AMI, the instance type, and we've added a tag. How do we now deploy that to AWS? Well, all we do is type in Terraform, apply, and this is going to apply the changes to AWS. So let's hit enter. And it would be helpful if I save this file first. So let's save it and try that again. And look what it does here. So let me open this up. It does kind of a git add subtract versioning here. It gives you a rundown of all of the actions it's about to perform. And if you see everything with the green plus, it's gonna create that. So the AWS instance is gonna create all of these things. So you see AMI, here's the AMI ID. If you see known after apply, this is because things usually don't get IDs and things like that until they're created. So this means we don't know yet. We'll only know after you apply it and run this command. So we can scroll down and see everything that's gonna be applied. We have an EBS block device. We have some metadata options, a network interface those kind of things. If this all looks good, which you should always check this over, if it looks good, then down here where it says enter a value, it says, do you want to perform these actions? We're gonna say yes, and we're gonna deploy this EC2 instance. All right, apply complete. So if we go to AWS now in the EC2 section of AWS, and you'll see that we have our instance, my Terraform instance running, 
And it should have tags, tags of name, my Terraform instance. Awesome, now let's look at one other thing. When we did that, it created a state file. So if you go to terraform.tfstate, you'll see the entire state of your infrastructure. This is the single source of truth of what your infrastructure looks like. So here's an array of resources. We have a type of AW instance and all of the information about that instance. So when we make another change to our configuration, it's gonna compare it to our state and make changes accordingly. So if I wanna take this name and change it to my new Terraform instance, and then I run Terraform apply, let's see what happens. It's gonna tell me here, now, now you see these yellow uh, tilde, I think it's called a tilde symbol. That tells us that these resources are gonna be updated in place. It doesn't have to recreate anything. It can update that resource in place. And you'll see here, it's gonna update the name of my Terraform instance to my new Terraform instance. That looks good. Come down here and type yes, and it will make that change. So you'll see, and you'll see here modifying, modifications complete after one second. If we go to AWS and refresh, I should have the new name. Yep, my new Terraform instance. Pretty cool. Now, what if I want to get rid of this instance? I can run terraform destroy. And when I do that, it's going to tell me what's about to go down. See all of these red minuses? This means all of this will be removed. If I like it, type in yes, and my EC2 instance will be destroyed. After about 30 seconds, my destroy is complete. If I look at AWS, refresh, it should be terminated. Yep, instance is terminated. But now imagine that you have a lot of resources, like you have 15 instances, a couple of VPCs. This really doesn't scale, because if you want to change something, you got to search through the whole thing, change values, everything's hard-coded. We don't want hard-coded. Hard-coded doesn't scale. So what can we do about that? Well, let's create a new file called variables.tf. And this really could be named anything, because Terraform looks at each file, each Terraform file when it runs. Um, and it'll see these variables, but we're just gonna call it variables.tf to make sense. And I'm gonna paste some variables here. So we declare each one with this variable declaration, and we're gonna call this one instance name. We have a description, a value of the name tag for the EC2 instance. Type is string, and default is my new instance. We have another variable, uh, EC2 instance type, description, AWS EC2 instance type, type a string, and default is T2 micro. Now that we have these variables, we can go back to our main file and where we see T2 micro, we can do var dot EC2 instance type to use that variable here. And for name, we can do var dot um, instance, yeah, instance name and save that. And if we run Terraform apply, it should run fine. <clears throat> Just like it did before. Let me type yes here to confirm. And that ran fine because we have default values for our variables. Now, what if we wanna declare it to be something else, not the default? So currently the name is, because of our new variable, my new instance. What if we wanna make that something else? We don't want it to be the default. Well, when we run Terraform apply, we can add vars to it. So we can do dash var, and in quotes here, we can say instance name, which is this variable, equals my new name EC2. We can run that and it overrides the default by declaring variables. So you can do terraform apply dash var this dash var that and declare all of the vars you need to set these variables. If I hit yes, it should make the modification. And that should now be changed to my new name, EC2. But you see the problem here already. That doesn't scale either. If we have 100 variables, I don't want to write dash var something equals something 100 times. So what we can do now, to make it scalable, we can create a file called terraform.tfvars. Now look how cool this is. Here, I can just put EC2 instance type equals T2 micro, instance name equals my instance name from file, just some other name. And what I can do is in my variables, I have variables declared, right? In my main file, I'm using these variables. Well, in this terraform.tfvars file, I can just do EC2 instance type equals this, 
instance name equals this, and I can have my 100 variables here. And this will override the defaults. So when you need to update your Terraform configuration, you have this file, which will have all of your variables in it with their values, and you can just update the values here in one file. Pretty cool. So if I wanna change this to T3 micro, this is actually gonna to have to recreate a new instance, I think. So if I do Terraform apply, and I don't have to put any var parameters on my command here. So let me hit enter, and it's gonna read this TF vars file, and it's gonna see what my configuration is. And actually, it doesn't have to create a new one. It can update it in place. So let's put yes, and see what happens. Apply is complete after 43 seconds. Let's go back and refresh, and I should have a T3 micro now. Yep, T3 micro. So I hope that made sense to you. I have the main file where I'm declaring the resources. And then I have this variables file where I'm declaring variables. I'm giving it a variable name to where I can assign that variable name some value. And then I have this tfvars file that's just gonna be my key value, key value all the way down. This is where I'm gonna change all of my values, all of my configuration values. Now, another important thing for Terraform is outputs. So let's create a new file called output.tf. And a lot of times when you run this, you want it to output some data. Like if you're gonna run this in a pipeline and you need to know the public IP address so that you can ping it and see if it's online or something like that, and you need it to output some data, you can use outputs. So let me paste this here. And we're gonna have two outputs here. The first output, this is the output declaration, is the first one's gonna be instance ID. This is gonna be the ID of the EC2 instance. And the value here is AWS instance dot app server dot ID. Now, what is all of this? Well, if we go back to our main, the AWS instance is the resource. So AWS instance dot, and then the resource name, app server, and then the ID of that resource. And you can see all of that in the documentation. If we scroll down here, we should see ID somewhere. And you'll see it here in the examples. Like for VPCs, you have AWS underscore VPC, which is the resource. Then you have my VPC, which is the resource name. That's what you named it dot ID, and that's to get the ID. So what we're doing here is every time this runs, we're gonna output the ID of the EC2 instance and the public IP address of that EC2 instance. So here it's AWS instance dot app server, same thing, dot public IP. So to make this work, you have to do another Terraform apply and changes to outputs. Let's do yes. And you'll see outputs instance ID is this an instance public IP is this. And anytime you wanna see it without applying, you can do uh, Terraform output, and it'll show you the outputs. And that data is actually being queried. So that's querying data with outputs. Now I wanna to jump to a more realistic example. So this was just to show you some of the features of Terraform. Let me show you kind of a real world scenario. So let's kill this first. Let's do a Terraform destroy to get rid of this so we don't get charged for that. Yes, to destroy it. And while that's destroying, let me pull this up. So this is a more realistic example. So here we have kind of the same thing set up. We have our main file. We have some outputs, same outputs. We have variables. We have one, two, we have a handful of variables. We got our VPC side arrange, VPC name, subnet side arrange, subnet name, internet gateway name, EC2 AMI, and EC2 name. And then we have the var, the TF vars file, where we can just declare overrides here. And this is actually going to deploy an AWS environment. So if you look at the main file, and if you don't know what some of this stuff is, a couple of weeks ago, I did an AWS networking video where I explain all of the basic networking in AWS. You might want to go check that out. It was really helpful for a lot of people, and it'll help you understand what's going on here. I'll put a link to it above. But here we have the VPC. We have the subnet for that VPC, you'll see that it's associated with the VPC here by supplying the VPC ID. We have a internet gateway. That's our route to the internet. We create a route table with the internet gateway route. We associate that route table with the subnet. We create a new security group, open to HTTP traffic, and we create an EC2 instance and here you see we have a little more info. We have an AMI uh, instance type. We have a, the subnet ID. We have the security group ID. We declare a public IP address for it, or we associate a public address to it. And then we have some user data. 
With EC2 instances, you can include user data that runs when the instance spins up. So this is actually going to install an Nginx server and print an H1 message on the page. And then finally, we have some tags. So we have the whole thing here. We have the whole networking, the route table, the security group, and the EC2 instance. So if I'm gonna run this, and this is a lot to do manually. If you have to do this manually, it's gonna be at least 15 to 20 minutes to click everything and wait for everything to spin up. Let's see how long it takes with Terraform. So Terraform apply. Seven resources to add. If you look at this, a lot of stuff is being added. This manually would take a long time. Let's type yes and see how long it takes. That took 32 seconds. Can you believe that? That would have taken me 15 minutes to go into AWS and click around and get all of that stuff built out. The VPC, the subnet, the route tables, the internet gateway, security group, the EC2 instance, that would have taken me 15 minutes. And this is completely repeatable. Let's say I need to do some work in AWS. I can spin this up in 30 seconds, do all of my work, destroy it. A couple of days later, I need to do some more work, spin it all up, do my work, destroy it. 30 seconds up, 30 seconds down, it's pretty good. So let's take a look at what this built in AWS. So we have our VPCs. I should have two now, the default and then the one I just built. Here's my test VPC. Here's my test subnet, my route table with an internet gateway route, my subnet association here. And if I go to my EC2 instance, let me refresh, click on my test EC2. And if I click on this public address, I should have an Nginx server running. And let me actually copy this and try it in a different browser. Let's do HTTP. And this is my new server. My Nginx server is running. All in 32 seconds. That all got spun up. We open this. Terraform destroy. There it is. That's like 35 seconds. 32 seconds to spin it up. Do my work. 35 seconds to spin it down. I don't have to go in AWS and click around and waste time. That's the power of Terraform. If you're in DevOps, you're in SRE, cloud computing, you gotta know this. This is the industry standard. If you're a developer, this will seriously help your career out and help you out with your side projects in your development day to day. I hope you found this helpful. If so, give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing, and I'll see you in the next video.